Okay. Right, everyone, I'd like to call us to order at 1.13. On to an acknowledgement of the land. Mr. Trustee Long, would you please? Okay. Turn your mic on, please. Pull it towards you a little bit. Got it. There we go. <clears throat> okay. Welcome to our division office, located on the traditional land and territory of the Nitsitapi, Pekani, Kainai, and Sisika, the Blackfoot people, within the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. Thank you. Recommendation that the January 8th, 2020 consent agenda be approved by the Board of Trustees as presented. Can I get someone to make that motion, please? Trustee Long. If there's no errors or omissions, all in favor? Passed. Emergent changes to the agenda that the January 8th, 2020 regular board meeting agenda be approved by the Board of Trustees as presented or amended. Can I get someone to make the motion? Trustee Poitras. At this time, I would like to add an emergent, emergent motion to our agenda, which would be um, we can do, oh, it's already added in there as E6, is an emergent item agenda change. Thank you, Nikki. So can I get some, is there any other changes? to the agenda? Any other emergent changes to the agenda? Can you please speak into your mic? Uh, the motion for voting, is that what's been added? No, the proposed date change. Okay. So I, you were gonna do I make that notice of motion now? If you'd like to. Yes, I'd like to make well, it. Uh, sorry, sorry, Mr. Trustee Long, I'd like to approve this agenda first and then we can do a notice of motion afterwards. All in favor of approval of the agenda as amended? Passed, thank you. Is there any declaration of conflict of interest with this agenda at all? Seeing none. Okay. Trustee, Trustee Long, would you like to do your? Yes, uh, notice a motion. I would like to be put on the February agenda for voting procedures for board positions. Nikki, are you good with that? Thank you. Thank you. On to action items E1. Recommendation that the Board of Trustees approve the LRSD fact sheet on reserves based on the 2019 audit financial statements. Can I get someone to make that motion, please? Trustee Toon. Mr. Perry. Mike, please. Oh. <laughs> and here I was laughing at Greg when you had to tell him to speak into his mic. <laughs> Testing? Okay. So this is the uh, LRSD fact sheet on reserves as of August 31st, 2019. So there's already something I need to change on that document. You can see that I have 2018 on there because I used the template from last time. But it is as of 2019. So um, this document we've brought to you in the past, um, it gives an explanation of what um, uh, reserves are, um, a definition of them, and it goes into where we currently are and where we've been in the past and where we're going into the future. It's based on the uh, um, update, the uh, 
fall budget update that was provided in December at the December board meeting, and it's based on that. But I'll go through it with you, um, given that uh, due to the time frame of this meeting, it was not made available to you um, to, to look over in advance. So um, there, there are five. So number two on the, the document, it's in front of you that we didn't hand it out. Um, there are five types of surf surpluses or reserves that are included in an accumulated surplus on our financial statements. Invested in tangible capital assets, and those are funds that we have spent money on as far as equipment, and they're not in a cash form, they're in an uh, asset form, and they're amortized over time. And so as we amortize them, that amount decreases. Endowments are, is money that's been donated and that we hold and reinvest and use for whatever specific purpose that was provided. Uh, we don't have any of those that we hold at the division level. Unrestricted surplus is normally um, uh, funds that have not been restricted or assigned to any specific item. Operating reserves are funds that have been designated for specific operating purposes, and capital reserves are funds held for acquiring future capital assets. So those are the five types of uh, funds that you might find in the accumulated surplus. The three that we focus on typically is unrestricted surplus, operating reserves, and capital reserves because they have a future um, benefit that we can use funds toward. So number three is the uh, current level, and it's broken into various categories, um, school and instruction, maintenance, transportation, board and system admin. And you can see that uh, in most scenarios, um, there's been a reduction um, in those areas, except for the capital side. And the overall arching reason for that is that we took some of the funds that we were holding in capital or in operating reserves, which were meant for capital, and we reassigned them to capital to properly um, demonstrate to the provincial government what those funds were being held for. And so uh, this is a better reflection of uh, the funds that we were holding or are holding and uh, what their uses are for. So you can see that um, there's overall totals uh, went down in unrestricted from 661,000 to 397. Operating reserves went down from 4.7 million to 2.8 million and capital reserves went up 2.4 from 111,000. And the funds currently in uh, invested in tangible capital assets is 6.9 million. Uh, that's basically uh, what the the change was in number four, so I'll skip to the next page. And I actually decided to put um, a chart on here just to give a visual representation of uh, what, how over time um, our reserves have, have been. So um, the far left blue is 2015, and the lighter blue on the far right is uh, 2019. And it's divided each by those individual uh, um, operating reserves and unrestricted surplus and capital reserves. So you can see a steady decline in the operating reserves um, for most areas. And then when you get over to capital, because we made that transition in the one year, there's a significant increase in that area. Number five, what is an appropriate level of operating reserves for school boards? This document will be after today, and if it's approved by the board, will be put on the website. Um, so it's a public document after uh, um, the approval of it. But what is the appropriate level of reserves? Um, the Auditor General came out and basically said that 5% of uh, operating expenditures. Um, so where are we? LRSD operating reserves uh, for instruction are below the 5%, but when you take into account the operating in, uh, levels for um, schools, maintenance, transportation, and board and system admin, we're actually at 5.92. Um, that's the operating reserves. However, based on the budget that we just presented, uh, using almost a million dollars of our reserves in this current year's budget, um, that will obviously put us significantly under the 5% that uh, um, the Auditor General has um, dem or indicated would be an appropriate level of reserves. It's a trend that's pretty much going on throughout the, throughout the province with regards to the use of reserves for the current year's budget. Um, the next page is, a uh, again, another chart, and it just 
puts the same uh, amount of reserves, but it puts it in a percentage um, uh, picture. And then in point six, how will LRSD use current reserves? And here's the almost a million dollars that's being used. So unrestricted, that's to been to maintain the classroom improvement initiatives such as behavior supports and numeracy supports. Um, schools are using uh, reserves to, for supplies and staffing for school improvement initiatives that were, uh, were required to be passed through the superintendent. Um, and there was ongoing discussions about that. And in the maintenance area, 366,000 is being used to cover the uh, insurance premiums that skyrocketed significantly. So this is the amount above and beyond what the budget would be able to handle. It's coming out of reserves. And so that is kind of the story. The, uh, um, what are number seven, which is the last page, uh, what are board approved reserves going forward? Um, uh, this page gives an indication and it's no different than what it was last year other than a few minor uh, changes just based on uh, um, um, numbers, but this is more or less um, why this the division or the board is holding reserves uh, in any particular area. So um, the ones from the unrestricted surplus will be used in the in the current year's budget. Operating reserves, uh, the division where possible will maintain a, a reasonable contingency for schools considered uh, school operating reserves. Uh, a small change um, from last year uh, is that, uh, um, and we indicated this to the board at, uh, in previous meetings, uh, but we are closely monitoring uh, what reserves are available and we're allocating now to schools based on need versus allowing schools to have reserves that are significantly uh, higher because they chose not to spend them. So it's more of a concentrated management of the reserves versus uh, just allow schools to hold on to whatever they they don't use and uh, that's why there was a shift in uh, um, allowing boards through uh, passing their plans through the superintendent to um, use on school initiatives for the fall for the current year international international program will maintain a reasonable contingency um, the instructional pool will hold a reasonable con contingency for certificated staffing support staffing complex needs divisional initiatives CTS equipment and technology, so we have the ability to, to respond to needs that arise throughout the year um, from these contingencies. Um, maintenance, plant operation and maintenance will hold a reasonable contingency as well. Most of their reserves now are no longer in operations. The majority of them will be used for insurance this year. Uh, the remaining, which is the majority of the reserves, are in capital, which are planned for uh, a maintenance shop. Um, 1.3 million of which in those reserves is related to a wind power investment that we receive over time. Um, and this reserve will increase and decrease based on the amount that is amortized over out of the other reserve which is invested in capital, tangible capital assets. Transportation no longer has any operating reserves based on the last, I think, four out of uh, six years of deficits. Um, at this point, uh, they can maintain a, a reasonable contingency, but they don't have any operating reserves at this point. Um, health and safety has a small uh, reserve that it holds for contingency, and board and system admin also has a reasonable contingency for board initiatives and operations. Um, so if the board has a, an initiative that they want to see go forward, then they have access to those funds to be able to, to do so. That is kind of the well not kind of that is the um, the board approved um, I guess uh, definition of what reserves are being held and why they're being held in, a, in the jurisdiction along with where we currently are so um, I'll leave it with that and if there's any questions that you might have in relation to the document then I can certainly answer those trustee long yeah mr. Perry um, the wind power investments Mm -hmm. uh, which I'm uh, looking for where that was doesn't matter it uh, it stated that we would receive that money over the next eight years right is that going to be incremental so much per year a lump sum within the next eight years how how will that investment come to us so uh, it's not equally distributed throughout the eight years it's uh, um, based on a schedule so um, uh, more principal will be received from that investment uh, over time 
with the the last payment being the largest payment, but it'll be spread out throughout the eight years. Uh, and uh, right now it's set up as a receivable. Um, so it's receiving back the principal that we initially invested into the project. And so those dollars are set up as a reserve and they're received equally over, not equally, but over time based on that schedule. Does that answer your question? Yep. One more thing. And I know we have discussed this partially before. Of course, I wasn't here when that investment was made. So can you tell me what kind of investment it is? Like, sure. did we buy a windmill or? Uh, in essence, yes, but we basically invested through uh, NMAX was the company at the time with two other jurisdictions in the province. It was an initiative that was supported by the provincial government. Um, and so we were able to use funds that were uh, remaining from other projects um, toward this investment. Uh, we also received with that investment a, a rate for our uh, energy, for our electricity, um, through the building of a, a, a windmill uh, through NMAX. So um, it was a good investment at the time. The rate that was set was set uh, for the 20 year time period. And uh, so it's proven to be beneficial to us but we get that principle back over time, as well as um, uh, a rate of return based on a schedule that, uh, uh, and that rate of return goes into the POM budget. Yeah. Trustee McKee. So that um, rate of return, uh, like it's over a hundred thousand dollars rate, like a hundred and thirty, hundred and sixty thousand. Like you said, it varies, but it, uh, it's somewhere in that area, isn't it? So the rate of return would have been higher at the beginning of the uh, um, investment, while the principal in this invested was higher. As we receive dollars uh, back in principal from that, the rate of return diminishes. So the level of return was based on the amount of principal that we had in the investment at the time. Go ahead. Can I just ask? Can I just ask one more question, please? So, in the overall picture um, for your reserves, um, so so this the school division has had a decreasing um, amount um, in reserves compared to last year, right? Like the amount of reserves that we had is uh, is slowly decreasing. Am I not correct on that? The amount of reserves in the area of unrestricted school and operating reserves is decreasing, yes. Um, in this one year, uh, capital reserves, which were being held in operating, were, were transferred over to uh, capital. Um, so there's an increase in the capital, but overall there was a decrease in those three areas, yes. And that was, that was planned. Uh, as we continue to plan in this year, there'll be, uh, uh, if everything was to go as budget, uh, almost a million dollar decrease in the amount of reserves. That's not capital reserves, that's operating reserves. So that entire million dollars will come out of operating reserves and unrestricted reserves uh, versus um, capital. Capital will maintain its level um, until uh, we expend those on capital assets. Thank you. Any other questions? I just have a quick one. Um, you sure. said they, this is going to go on the website. Does it just go on the LRSD website, or does it go on all school websites? Uh, just on the LRSD website. It's okay. a divisional document, not a school document. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. and so along with this, um, the other documents that are in that same area um, is our audited financial statements, our uh, all budget update, and uh, um, the fact sheet on, on reserves. Thank you. Yep. So the recommendation was that the Board of Trustees approve the LSD fact sheet on reserves based on the 2019 audited financial statements. All in favor? Pass. And I'll just make one other note. We do send this up to Alberta Education so that they have a copy of yep. what our reserves are and the explanation for them. Thank you. Yep. On to E2. The board believes Mr. Siegman has met the expectations of the board since he started in the role of superintendent for LRSD. 
recommendation that the Board of Trustees approve the reappointment of Mr. Daryl Seguin as the Superintendent of Livingston Range School Division. Can I get someone to make that motion, please? Trustee Burdett? Did you want to speak to it, Trustee Burdett? Yeah, you're good. Okay, I'm on. Um, yeah, we, uh, I think that, uh, that uh, Mr. Seguin has proven to us that over the last two years that he's very competent at, at the job that he's been doing. And of course, only had a two year contract, so we had to renew his contract. And I believe <coughs> that we are wise in renewing that contract. He's doing a very good job, and I thank him for that. Any other questions, comments? Trustee Kuhn? I just want to thank uh, Superintendent Seguin for his leadership during the, the last uh, few years. I really appreciate all that he's done for the division. And I just wanted to thank our chair and vice chair for helping us facilitate the board's work in this process. Thank you. Go ahead. Thanks, Ori. Uh, yeah, just wanted to take a minute to publicly express my uh, gratitude for the opportunity to take on this role. I know it's uh, a very important uh, position for the school board, and uh, it's a lot of trust in me um, and my team. And so I certainly appreciate the opportunity over the last couple of years uh, to work in this capacity, and I'm really excited about the things that we've been able to have been able to accomplish during that time and certainly look forward to all that we will do in the next five years. So thank you very much. Thank you. I also want to echo everyone else's comments too. It's been as vice chair last in the last two terms and then now chair, it's been a really great privilege to work with you and along with the board. And I think we have a really great working relationship. So thank you again too, Daryl. All in favor? Pass. It's official now. All right, thank you. On to E3, professional learning. Um, there was no new up and coming um, professional learning opportunities that anybody had requested to, so we have nothing on that one. On to E4, Pincher Creek Early Learning Board. Trustee Poitras will update the board on the December 19th. Um, it was yesterday. Okay, the, yeah, it was originally scheduled for December 19th, but she was able to attend yesterday on the Pincher Creek Early Learning Center meeting that she attended as the LRSD board representative. Recommendation that the board of trustees approve and we'll just leave that blank for right now to attend future meetings of the Pincher Creek Early Learning as the LRSD representative. Can I get someone to make that motion, please? Trustee Toon? Can I make a motion? Oh. Trustee Yep. Do you want to change the, or you want to just make a motion right now? So the recommendation that the Board of Trustees approve Trustee Poitras attend future meetings of the Pincher Creek Early Learning as the LRSD Board of Representation. All in favor of the motion? Oh. Yeah, because he made a motion. Yep. Now we have we to vote a, on it. Oh, yeah, discussion, we can have discussion on it. On Sorry, it. discussion on it. Yeah. Is it, so I'd like, want... but I'd like her to give an update because we were going to approve whether or not it was all going to happen. Yep. Okay. Trustee Poitras will just give us an update first. Uh, so I was able to go and attend. Uh, they had a meeting on January 7th, yesterday <laughs> evening. And this is the Pincher Creek Community Early Learning Center. They are currently have two um, daycares in St. Mike's. And we are now, they are building a building on Canyon School land that will now house our um, Sorry, <laughs> it will now house this daycare facility as well as our preschool facility, which will be in there together. So as this process goes forward, they ask to have our voice at the table so that we can be a part of the process. Um, I think it's really important. St. Mike's has had um, 
the opportunity to have these early learning programs and this daycare facility in St. Mike's and it gets people familiar with the school and families comfortable so when it comes time to choose a school um, St. Mike's often may be the first choice just due to f familiarity so um, I think it also sets a precedent that we are a school division that encourages early learning opportunities and that we're willing to work in partnerships those are kind of my thoughts. I have a copy of the report here that I will send out to all of you. Um, uh, they're currently still building uh, the building and applying for grants. Windows are in out there was a big victory for them recently and they're moving forward with their building plans hoping to open May 1st. Any questions for Trustee Poitras? Uh, I just have a couple. Yeah. Um, did they have like any terms of reference outlined as to what their mandate is and, and why, um, who was going to be on the board with you? Um, so a little bit of history. For the past 40 years, there was the Children's World Daycare in Pincher Creek. And they approached the town saying that they wanted the help from the town and a little bit of direction. And so after 40 years, that closed down and transitioned into this new um, Pincher Creek community early learning. And part of what they said they wanted to do was to meet with representatives from both of the school boards involved, members from Alberta Children's Services, uh, senior staff, and a member from the council to discuss important the importance of collaboration in the development of a world-class early learning community and environment. After they had that meeting, which took place on September 5th, they just said, everyone in that room, like it was such a good meeting. This is who we need at the table. This, we need all these opinions to stay and all these different uh, shareholders, or I guess people who, stakeholders, to be at the table. And although in here it just says they wanted to meet with them and it's not mandated that everyone be on the board, it is their hope that all of these people, and they all do sit at the table currently. Trustee Tim. Thank you. Just to clarify, this is a full membership with voting privileges, as you've stated earlier. Yes, yeah, so originally the conversation happened, and it was just an information and to be there almost as a liaison. But like I said, they value everyone's opinions and felt like everyone at the table should have the right to vote. So the position that they would like a board member to have is to sit on the board of directors, one of nine, and have the ability to vote. Trustee Tim? Is there a term of that the directors sit on? Is it a two-year term, or what, is this just something? I know we have it set that it would just, we'd, we'd appoint at our next organizational meeting, but are, are there, in their terms of reference, is there anything that states a, a term for the director? I am not 100% sure on that. I. I will definitely look through here and see, um, but right now I'm not 100% sure. Okay. I think this is a great opportunity uh, for us as a board to be able to see what students will be coming into kindergarten. Um, so as an opportunity for planning for our student, our student budget and stuff like that. So I think that, yeah, I think this is a great opportunity. Brad, did you want to close? Too? Anybody? I see no other hands, so. Okay, thank you. I uh, appreciate Trustee Poitras' willingness to step up and as the rep for Canyon, I think it's a, a natural fit for the board and I, she's done a great job attending the meeting, so I think that it, it look forward to the great reports she's gonna bring back to the board on this. Thank you, so the board of trustees approved Trustee Poitras to attend future meetings of the Pension Creek Early Learning as an LRSD board representative. All in favor? <laughs> Pass. We're just gonna skip on to E6, the emergent item edition. Uh, I would, the board chair would propose a change of dates for the board meetings in February and June of 2020. Recommendation that the board of trustees approve the change of board meeting dates of February 12th, 2020 to February 10th of 2020 and June 10th of 2020 to June 15th of 2020. Can I get someone to make that motion? Trustee Long. 
Trustee Long, did you want to speak to it? No, I just want to clarify again. So to the 15th of June. Yes. Okay, thanks. Is there any questions or comments? I just want to say thank you for the consideration of this. There was uh, just some conflicts on those dates, and so having them moved uh, is a real benefit. And so I just want to show appreciation for that. Um, seeing no other questions or comments, all in favor? Thank you. Pass. Mr. Perry has just gone to get Laura Stalker to so that she can give us our board policy 21 update. I know. Look at me go. Sure. So we'll just jump on to uh, discussion and information items on to F2. Uh, Daryl Seguin will inform the board regarding up and coming student field trips. All right, great, thank you. Um, just take a couple of minutes of your time. As you know, with our administrative procedure 259, any out of uh, province or out of country trips um, are to be brought to the board's attention for information and uh, any questions. So we have two groups heading out um, during April. The first one is FP Walsh, April 5th through 18th. There are 14 high school students. Um, it's a small group, so they will be combining with another school. And it's through EF Tours. And the staff organizing the trip have made numerous connections to the high school social studies curriculum. Uh, they will be traveling through uh, Germany, uh, walking tours of a, a lot of the major cities in Europe, but uh, start out in Germany, a walking tour of Berlin, uh, visiting Checkpoint Charlie. Uh, they'll be moving on to Prague and a walking tour there of different cathedrals, um, some of the artwork there and the different gardens that are available. From there, moving to Poland, to Krakow, and to Auschwitz and Birkenau, the different concentration camps. So it'll be a very powerful experience for them. And they will be ending their trip in uh, Budapest and Hungary, or sorry, and, uh, and Vienna with some walking tours there. Uh, Chris Baxter and Susan Stackruck are the staff members that would be going with that group at that time. Any questions on that one before I move to the next? How many students are, how many students are going? Uh, there's 14 on that FP Walsh trip. They were hoping for 20. Um, they needed 20 in order to kind of go solo, but since it was under 20, it uh, had to be adjusted slightly, and they would be combining now with another group. Oh, I see. Trustee Toon? Are there any parents or any uh, other adults or just the two staff members at attending? Right now, it's uh, just those two staff members um, for the 14. They have a, a tour guide that's through EF Tours, um, and then the other school um, would be along with them as well. But. Trustee Long? Um, let's remember to definitely have them come and speak to us after. I say, I, I, that just seems like an incredible trip, mm -hmm. learning-wise. I'd like to hear from them, for sure. So maybe Nikki will remember. Uh, who's on the list? All right, I'll move on to the Willow Creek Composite High School. Uh, they are taking a group of 13 junior high students on a Canadian heritage tour in Ontario and Quebec, April 17th through the 26th. Again, this uh, trip is organized through EF Tours. And again, it's tied to the, the junior high social studies curriculum. Uh, they will be seeing the parliament buildings, um, some different forts where critical battles in history occurred. There's guided tours in Quebec City, Montreal, Ottawa, and Toronto. And uh, since they're down that way, they'll be fitting in some visits to the CN Tower, Niagara Falls, and the Hockey Hall of Fame as well. Um, staff members Mary Franz, Shane Hawk, and Jackie Devarnachuk are scheduled to lead that group along with uh, parent Ken Wright. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Oh, oh Trustee Long? 
being silly again, can we, uh, can I make a motion that a trustee? <laughs> never, never mind. Nice try. <laughs> Yeah, what great opportunities. I'm glad that our students are able to have these opportunities to be able to do some traveling through their school experiences and tying it to the, tr the curriculum. Thank you. We now have back to E5, our board policy 21. I see Laura's entered the room now. Recommendation that the Board of Trustees approve the changes to board policy 21 as presented or amended. Can I get someone to make that motion, please? Trustee McKee. Welcome up, Laura. Thank you for coming. Nikki will just put a mic on you. Yeah, because we have a record, because we're recorded, we need you to have a mic. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, first off, I wanted to thank you for lunch as well today. So put a little, little closer. Yeah, thank you feel like a rock star I or know. something. Um, anyways, yeah, so thank you for lunch today, too. Uh, there was quite a few of us that uh, really wanted to send that appreciation to. Um, so I've been asked to come and talk about some of the recommendations that I've made to Policy um, 21, as well as one of the admin procedures. Uh, so the requirement, I'm not sure if any of you know, the health and safety legislation changed in June, in June of 2018 to... Uh, includes more information about violence and harassment in the workplace. Um, so we ha are reviewing some of the policies and uh, the procedures, and we just found that we needed to um, add a little bit more of the piece on the uh, violence into policy 21. So I went through it and kind of made some revisions. They're highlighted up here in the red, and I'll just kind of talk to you about uh, where I came up with those and um, and why they're recommended to change. Um, so it all comes from the legislation from the Alberta Health and Safety Code in Part 27. Uh, so the first recommendation is that we um, wanted to, to heighten that and add that preventing and eliminating um, and reasonably practicable, that just comes right out of the legislation in controlling the harassment and workplace violence. In the second paragraph, we just added the health and safety uh, legislation from Alberta. And again, just emphasize that we're committed to a safe learning and work environment and will not tolerate acts of harassment or violence against staff or students. Um, in the previous one, there was a definition for bullying um, as well as discrimination. And the uh, legislation kind of changed that so that they made just two definitions, the harassment and violence, and the discrimination um, is involved in the harassment as well as bullying is in that definition now. So um, the one thing that I did add was that, um, I'm not sure whereabouts it is on there, but uh, the board prohibits bullying, harassment, discriminatory and violent behaviors and ex uh, expects allegations of such behaviors to be reported before it just said to be investigated in a timely and respectful manner and I think it's important to add that to be reported as well um, then again we just put in harassment I took the right the whole wording right out of the definition of the Health and Safety Act the, these other definitions, discrimination, personal harassment, sexual harassment, I didn't change any of those things. I just put them underneath, and bullying, I just put them all underneath the, her, the uh, title of harassment. Then we added the uh, violence piece in there, um, and just again took the definition right out of the legislation. We put uh, whether at a work site or work related, um, causes or likely to cause physical or psychological injury. That was one of the big things with the health and safety legislation is the psychological uh, aspects. Then there's the definitions for the sexual violence and domestic violence. Again, took those right out of the, the act. Um, and then we left everything to number three is a new, uh, the whole piece, the, the criminal code and the um, Alberta Occupation Health and Safety Act regulations and codes uh, 
protect individuals from harassment and violence in all forms, and then I just took that right out of the legislation as well. When I was updating this, I updated the um, School Act to the Education Act as well. Um, and then it was number item number six, just above regulations there. We added the, um, or violence in there, it had harassment, and we just added the word violence as well. Um, the regulations went down here again, just changed to the Education Act and added the OHS Act. 5A, we had um, staff shall report any incidences um, of bullying, discrimination, harassment, or violence. There was um, admin procedure 350. I found the, n the name of it actually is code of conduct, so I changed that as well. Um, number 12 was also added. The uh, Health and Safety Committee is responsible to, uh, to help develop these policies and procedures and prevention plans, um, as well as add them to the hazard assessments. So that's part of the legislation. So I just added on there, um, the plans are to be reviewed after an incident every three years or as recommended by the committee. And that's really all the different changes that have been uh, recommended on there. Any questions? Trustee McKee? Just one part of this, I was uh, just reading through it. That domestic violence, is that something uh, new that's been written in? Because uh, I don't believe uh, uh, that was in the previous policy. So You're right. Yeah. Yes. If so, you just expand upon that just for a minute, please. Absolutely. So domestic violence, um, I think we added the definition in here what that is, but it's violence that is... Um, caused by your spouse, your child, somebody in a personal relationship. But if it filters into the workplace, that is when it affects work um, and when we need to report it so and investigate it. Yes, I saw that about spilling over, and I thought that was, uh, you know, a good addition to that policy. Yeah, I think it, it helps with the psychological wellness of employees. So if you're aware that they're having difficulties at home or something that's, that's bothering them, I think it's important to, to be there and help and offer guidance. Um, and that might be what the investigation just shows. Here's some counseling opportunities or things of that nature. Any other questions, comments? Oh, yeah, Trustee Mickey. Um, being part of the policy committee, I, I would be amiss if I didn't thank you for what you've done. You've done a lot of work on this and, uh, and all the changes that you've made. So uh, uh, thank you very much for, for um, updating that policy. We really appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. That'd be great. Mr. Stieglin? Yeah, I'll just add that, um, yeah, these changes are extensive. Um, we're still getting used to and being more familiar with the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And so these changes here, Laura actually um, has a contact at OHS that she sent this to and said, you know, would this be in line? And just checked it out from their end and they said, yes, definitely this meets their requirements as well. So um, yeah, I appreciate the time and effort that she's put into uh, this. She has also made some recommendations for admin procedure 307, I think it is. Um, and our admin procedure uh, working committee is meeting tomorrow. And so that's one of the things that we'll review at that meeting there is the uh, admin procedure that corresponds with this board work policy. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I stated in the beginning, Laura is our safety coordinator and you work part-time with us and West Bend. Part-time with West Bend. Right. And so, yes, thank you very much for all your work and it's really great having, having you here to be able to do this and keep us up to date on new and upcoming policies that are... So thank you very much, Laura. Recommendation that the board to change, approve the changes to board policy 21 as amended. All in favor? 
Passed. Thank you. All righty, on to our more of our discussion items. We'll go on to F1, our fiscal monitoring report. Jeff Perry, please. Okay, uh, Nikki, I, I put that in the folder if you want to bring that up. Yeah. So Anthony, Anthony and I have been working on a different report, but we didn't have time to finalize that to put that, to put that together. So it's in the same format as it has been in the past. Sorry, will you be sending these out to us later so that we, I just always like to keep everything in my own folder in yeah, my sure. Okay, thank you. Can you make it a little bigger? We only need one of those sections at a time. Is that good? You guys see that? Yeah. Okay, so this is actually um, the end of November. Um, based on when the uh, board meeting occurs, I won't say this every time we have this report, but just as a reminder, because this is the first report uh, for the new year, um, Timing-wise, we typically, at the end of November, once we've passed the fall update, fall budget update, we then upload um, the budget into our financial uh, system, and we have the ability now to track budget versus actual. And that's what this report is. It's a variance analysis to identify what was budgeted, what have we spent to date, and is that reasonable? And that's why there's comments usually attached to each line item. And so, overall, this is as of November, uh, 31st, I guess, which is, doesn't exist, but it's November 30th, 2019. Our report says November 31st, sorry. Just noticed that. We're not good with dates this year. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'll take that one out on Anthony when I get back. <laughs> the other one was my issue, my mistake. Um, so anyways, uh, as of... Uh, uh, the end of November, that's 25% uh, of the year that's occurred, 30% um, of the school year. So it's uh, three months out of the school year, three-tenths and uh, a quarter of the fiscal year. Uh, we receive our revenue over a 12-month period, so it, it would be more closer to 25%. Uh, um, the operating reserves overall are at 23%, and the, the biggest reason for that uh, is that um, uh, First Nation uh, revenues uh, we would have just invoiced out, and so those will come uh, at a later date, likely within J uh, January um, time period. Um, so uh, with the school-generated funds, which it says on number one, not included there, and the uh, First Nation revenues not uh, received yet, um, we're at 23.09. With both of those in, we would be over the 25% where we should be. Um, Expenditure-wise, um, you'll be able to see, I guess, better when we send this report out to you and, and see each individual line item. But for the most part, everything's within um, where it should be. Uh, the two high areas on this one is Canyon Preschool and Can or Canyon Daycare before and after, which is variable to the number of kids that are attending. And so that one has the ability to be up or down based on that. And for this purposes, we anticipate that that's up. Um, Uh, everything else there seems to be reasonable. The overall expenditures are 23.6%, and uh, there are some areas where we would not have expended uh, yet. One being technology um, would be low. You can see technology integration up there is 16.45%. Uh, much of that budget would be the evergreening, which happens over um, breaks and typically the summer, and so um, there'd be a, a gap there that makes sense to us. Um, and so for the most part, we're, and IMR would be the other one uh, that is, uh, would be low there, um, plant operation and maintenance. Okay, so you can go on to that. So typically we do it by um, uh, program and then we do it by object. It's the same numbers, just broken out differently. So it's based on salaries. Salaries are 25.5%, uh, benefits 23.9, which is typical in the first part of the fall. 
because some uh, um, staff have maxed out on EDI and CPP, the benefits would increase in January when they begin to pay those again. Um, uh, services purchased is the uh, low area in this in this case, and again, evergreening and uh, IMR are two areas where that comes out of. So again, we're at 23.59% overall. Okay, you can go to the next one. So this is where we're working on to provide uh, um, maybe information that is more readable. Um, but uh, this is the uh, instructional block. Uh, you can see that the Alberta education revenue is right on 25%, so we're right on where we anticipated our budget to be. Um, federal government revenues are 12% at this point, so those will increase significantly as they receive the invoices and, and begin to pay those. Um, uh, the other areas um, are, are based on uh, over time. So the total revenue for instructional is 23.2. Um, expenditures are 24%. Um, and again, services purchased being the, the low amount in there. Um, salaries for non-certificated are likely higher due to additional staff that may be, have been hired based on need since the, the budget. So, Okay, next one. This is a board and system admin. There's not a lot of revenue that comes in here. We have more of a transfer from other areas to this area, so it's not significant. Um, but the expenditure is around the 24% where we would anticipate being at this time. So, next. And uh, plant operation and maintenance. Um, overall uh, revenue, again, this is because we haven't received any IMR funding, or it hasn't been, it's, it's been put in deferred, it hasn't been recognized yet. We would have received it, but it's not in there, so that would put us over the 25% if we had that in there. Um, expenditures are around the 20, 23% overall. So everything seems to be within the reasonableness of, of the budget. Um, transportation is the next one. And again, 26% uh, percent, uh, revenue it received, um, but we're right around the 25% of where we budgeted. and. Uh, um, the other is the instructional transportation fees over the initial part of the, the um, uh, year, and many of that, much of that is received up front, and uh, the expenditures are around the 22% range. Um, again, salaries would be high because they're paid over a 10-month period versus a 12-month period, and so they're within the where we would expect them to be as well, based on the budget. And that. That, for the most part, is the uh, report. Is there any questions that you might have in relation to the financial report? It's hard when you just see it for the first time. I recognize that, yeah. So obviously, if, if there's questions that you have um, um, beyond this point when you look at it, feel free to email that to me. When I email the response, I'll, re I'll email it to everyone so that you all see what the response is and the question that's being asked. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Ooh, you're getting off easy. Thank you for the update. And like Mr. Perry said, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them and then can send it to all of us. Thank you. All righty, on to uh, F3, ESBAA. Um, Mr. Seguin, Trustee Poitras, and myself were able to meet with um, Kathy Hogg and what was Brian Callahan, uh, their executive director for PSBA. They um, have approached us about wanting them to join our association. And so we just thought we would share with you today a little bit about the meeting with them. Um, they shared some benefits that they felt um, would benefit us as a board. So I just thought I'd share those with you and we can have a discussion on if you need any further information from them or not. Um, PSBA is a voluntary organization which speaks specifically for public school boards in Alberta. Um, they are a member-driven organization 
They uh, fundamentally respect the local autonomy of individual member boards. It is a nonpartisan. They host MLA government receptions each fall where trustees have an opportunity to meet and network. Um, do you think that since there's no timeline on this, we should maybe table it as Clara wanted to be a part of the conversation? We're not making any decision on this today. This is just for okay. information. We're just sharing with the board our meeting. Right. There's no Sorry, motion on I this. Sorry, we were making. Okay. I just thought that she wanted to be a part of the discussion. So as long as we, I guess it would be in the minutes for her. Yeah, right now, um, unless somebody made a motion, we're only, I'm just, just sharing. Yeah, we could table it though. I mean, I'm good with whatever. I just thought that Clara might want to be a part of the conversation, but. Okay, we can table this um, discussion item to uh, our February meeting. Um, Clara was unable to be here today as she's had some surgery. Okay. On to F4, Regional School Council. Trustee Poitras will discuss the up and coming Regional School Council meeting on February 11th, 2020. Um, so this will be our second regional school council of the year. Normally we have three of them in a year and our February meeting has traditionally been a uh, VC, um, a video conference. We've not had much luck with attendance. So we'd like to try this year inviting all of the principals and board chairs to come here and have a meal with us and do the regional school council here on February 11th. So when you go to your board uh, or school council meetings, please let them know. We will also send out an email to principals and board chairs that it will be February 11th. If the road conditions are good, then we would ask that they come here and we will be discussing um, communication and uh, they will get a financial update from Jeff as well. Oh, yeah. Check, That's checks for everybody. Trustee. Is that, that what we're doing? Yeah. Trustee Long? Uh, perhaps. Would it be another opportunity for a faces presentation? I, I don't um, like exactly like we were just talking about. Uh, the more we do, the better. So if that's our, our school chairs that are there. Yeah, I agree that it would be um, a great time maybe to talk about faces at some point. Um, this is a very rare opportunity that board chairs and principals all get together. And so we try to stay really focused on things that pertain to them um, and kind of let them collaborate with one another. That is definitely something we can put on the list for perhaps a future, um, a future regional school council meeting. But this particular one, I think our agenda is pretty full um, with the presentations that we're going to have. Any other questions? Thank you, Trustee Poisters, for the update. At this time, I think we'll just take a 10 minute recess as we're well ahead of schedule. And so we'll just let everyone have a 10 minute bio break. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. We're going to get started again. Uh, we just have a little update that came to our attention from uh, Mr. Perry that he's just going to update us on. So uh, we have received a letter back from the uh, minister's office. It was signed by uh, the deputy minister, uh, Curtis Clark. Um, it's in relation to our request um, to transfer uh, uh, property over to the town of Clara's home. Uh, so on the uh, north uh, east corner of the West Meadow uh, Elementary School and uh, the response is in the affirmative so um, based on the conditions that we put forward in the letter they've responded posit positively to that uh, request and so we'll be communicating with the town of Clara's home today letting them know that uh, that has transpired so I just thought that would be important to bring to your attention I would li like the uh, there might be additional communication with the town of Clara's home in the in the future, but uh, that, as successful as it was in the town of Pincher Creek, it also has been approved in the town of Clara's home as well. So, Trustee McKee. 
that's certainly uh, very nice to hear. You could probably ask him if you want. I could just go get him from just next door there. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll send it to the individual that's been communicating with me, and she can take it up to him. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Perry. Uh, we just had one other item come up as uh, under the, the early, early learning today that Ms. Trustee Poitras is going to update us on too. Uh, so during our meeting, I received an email and because the Pincher Creek Family uh, Center has missed the opportunity for that first grant, they would like to apply for the recently announced Family Resource Network Expression of Interest um, grant, but the timeline is really quick. So it would be January 20th is when it is due. And so they're asking both school boards, us and St. Mike's, for a letter of um, support, and it would need to be in by January 13th. So I just wanted to uh, bring that to the board and see if I could make a motion that the board write a letter of support in regards to the Pincher Creek Family Center and the Pincher Creek Early Learning Child Coalition for the Family Resource Network Expression of Interest grant application. Nikki, you got that? Do you want me to bring my thing? Okay. Uh, so the motion is on the floor. Uh, any questions? Trustee Long? Uh, is Trustee Poitras, are you going to prepare that letter? I think as a, I think that um, we could prepare the, the letter. We'll work with Carly and we'll get a letter sent out on behalf of the Board of Trustees. Because it'll will, be on behalf of Living Will Street. we see it before you send it? Yep. Thank you. And it's pretty, it outlines in there specifically what they're looking for in the letter. Um, things that they, um, that would be helpful in the grant. So we could definitely send it out for everyone to take a look at before it goes. Any other questions or comments around that? Trustee Poitras, did you want to close? Yep. I. You're good with that? Yep. Okay. All in favor? Passed. All right. Thank you. Who's going first? Okay. We now have a presentation on our international education <coughs> by Mr. Kuzik. Thank you. Uh, please notice that Jeff Perry is leaving as I'm doing my presentation. <laughs> Somewhere in the notes that that could be recorded, that'd be very beneficial. So, um, As Nikki's getting that up, this has been a very busy time for international education this year. Um, some of the data that I'll show you, it'll notice that we, we're increasing um, the amount of, amount of students that are coming and the locations they're coming from. So, Oh, yeah, it's okay. Yes. Oh, it's okay. Okay, here we go. So, so we can skip by that first slide there. Um, and so again, I'm talking about students from afar. We have a number of students that come in across um, the world and come to, come into our beautiful uh, location, and we share what we have here at Livingston Range with the world and they share their gifts with us as they come. So it's been a process for about six years, which I've been involved off and on for that amount of time. Ken usually does his presentation, so hope I do it some justice here. So next one. And so you can see our lovely students that are coming. Um, uh, we we change things a bit where we try to get them to come on the same day, and that's, uh, that's me picking them up from all over the world, from Spain, Germany. A very excited bunch of students all all there and some volunteers and stuff like that. So using the bus, we go get them and, and then it begins. So in 2014-15, uh, Mr. Driscoll, our, our ex-superintendent, started kind of this process uh, before that, but it really got serious then when we had about 19 students. Uh, in 2015 and 16, we grew to 40 students. And 16 and 17, it grew to 79, but I want to be clear on that, those were a lot of short-term students. We had one-month students, two-month students, three-month students. Um, and very little full-time students that were here for half year or full year. And then the LSA came on board and we started the Livingston Ski Academy. We started using that to promote some of the wonderful opportunities we had for kids uh, internationally with that. 
and then we went to 67, and then last year down to 37, but that was mostly full-time students that were involved in that, and so there's a little bit more involved with those students, and also they, there's we get more too. Um, they get to hear, and we get to be part of their culture and share their culture, and, and then this year, in 1920, we had 50 students, with 32 of them being year-long students. Um, so this is one of our busiest years we've had for sure. Uh, with uh, four uh, semester students, and then we had four months, I include those as semester, those are students that go home at Christmas. And then we're trying with France, just recently, um, 10 students uh, coming for a couple of months in the end of June. So they're three months, three months or so. So that's a new, we, we don't usually do that. We're trying to focus on four months minimum, but with France, it's a new market for us. We are part of the Alberta government's initiative to to bring France on board and come into Alberta. And so they did a FAM tour and visited some of our schools uh, back in the fall. And from that meeting, that's when we, 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 we ended up getting them maybe to come. Yes, Greg, uh, sorry, uh, Trustee Long. Um, just while you're saying that, Chad, um, does the, the school year of the other countries affect you at all in terms of when they can come and go? It like if their school year is running like a different time than we are, does that have an impact on you, either negatively or positively? Yeah, we, we run on our system. It might impact them. Um, they might have to be short two months or late two months, but they come to us. So we don't necessarily adjust accordingly, but for some of the countries, it depends which one, that determines um, how much impact it has on them. Yeah, so, yeah, you're welcome. So, and where are students coming from this year? So from this year, if you hit that, uh, we have, we have 19 Spanish students, um, so there are main um, students that are coming um, from across the world, and they're from Spain. Uh, all of these have come from Spain, not from any other Spanish-speaking countries. So Japan, we had 10 students, uh, seven Germans, uh, one Vietnam student, one Turkish student um, this year, excited, one New Zealand, one Switzerland, and the 10 France, as I mentioned. Vietnam, Turkey, we had last year, but New Zealand, Switzerland, and France, these are relatively new um, places and destinations that students are coming from. So uh, that, that's, that's very exciting for the program. Um, just to we try to spread this out to make sure everybody's aware. We try to spread it out amongst the schools, but the student's application determines where we place the student. So um, depending on what they were looking for from us depends on where we place them based on the coordinators and the homestays and their suggestions. So CCHS has 10 students. We get a lot of requests for Livingston CCH for the mountains and that lifestyle and, the, and seeing a moose and all those wonderful things. Uh, and, and Matthew Halton as well. We have nine students. And then F.E. Walsh, uh, WCCHS, and J.T. Foster. We also have a number of international students spread across those high schools. Currently, we're working with 22 agents, but for the most part, I'd say 10 uh, specifically that send out the bulk of the students. So what we're trying, we're continuing to work with more agents to find the kids that will best fit in our division and be the most successful in their stay here. Next one. So our partnerships, we've, we do have a partnership with CAPSI, which is the Canadian Association of Public Schools International. Um, again, Dave Driscoll was a big part of that. He's a, he's, he's, he has leadership in a lot of these areas and, and, and works closely with them. Um, so when you, that organization that you work with looks, BC's involved and they're a big um, province with this, Alberta, all the provinces are involved in, in an international program. So you can join with them and they help you find um, the best suited candidates to come into our, our programs. Alberta Education is one that I've been working closely with, um, and most of the most of, of the students that have come have come from our relationship with Alberta Education. So what they do, they have an international program which they do what's called uh, FAM tours uh, to fil familiarize people. They bring agents over here, and they see our schools, see our people. Um, see the people that are involved in this, see the students, see, see if this is going to be somewhere they'd like to come and, uh, and see how our program operates, what happens uh, when they get here. And, and so they go through that and then from that also then we go together as a group from Alberta, sometimes all southern Alberta, mostly southern Alberta, and go to destinations and then try to meet agents and families and students to see if they want to come here. So that those connections are key in developing and growing this program. So the next slide. Um, we've changed things over the years, and you can hit the space bar again. 
you can hit all the space bars, I think. So we've changed things a little bit. Um, there was a lot more travel involved in years past. Um, lately, I've been going maybe once or every two years to a destination, to, to, to a market, to see if this is somewhere that we'd like to explore. We switched that around to do less travel because we wanted to provide more value added for the students to get here and provide our home state parents a network and, and a community, if you will, to, uh, to work together during some of these school-based activities. So we have Global Awareness Day, student presentations, same as what we do with the board. We have people present to schools and parents and stuff like that. We try to do that. But we also do these divisionally supported activities such as Banff Overnight Trip, Calgary Zoo, Hurricanes Game, and the Bovey Park. This is, to, again, we want to give our homestay people a little bit of a break because we do all our homestay, as everybody is aware, I hope, that we do our homestay. We're one of the few divisions that continues to, to do that um, because we believe in it. And we believe that's the most, uh, one of the most important factors of the students feeling comfortable and having success here. But they don't feel that they have to take the students to those, all those things all the time, right? And so um, with the group we have now, we have a wonderful group of homestay uh, folks and they can partake in some of these activities or not. And the students come with us and those are the activities we have planned. So the Hurricanes game that we're looking forward to, it's coming up here in February. And then hopefully Bovey Park. We haven't for the last three years, we've tried to do that one. Uh, but the problem is weather has always gotten in the way. So, uh, so that one will happen in the spring where we bring the kids to, and then show off what we have here in Livingston Ranch School Division. Waterton is one we'll probably work in next year. So these are activities. These are subsidized, I'll say the word. We pay a portion of the students' uh, fees to go on these. Uh, again, just because it's, it's a value added for the students and it gives our homestay people a break. So there's that. Next slide. Um, we have a team of people now on, and we're organized maybe different than some are. Um, we have wonderful coordinators, uh, Jazz, which we all know, Schmirler, uh, Catherine Mertz, uh, Renee Van Loon is new to the team. And these are the folks that looked after, after our homestay. So recruiting homestay folks, making sure everything's okay, checking with the kids when problems arise, they're the first contact, dealing, hopefully if there's any injuries or any accidents, they can be the first on the scene to help them with insurance and know what to do and what, how, to, how to deal with with the healthcare system and stuff like that. So they're the folks that look after the kids in the homes and the parents and uh, the home state parents. Jazz also is our administrative support that does most of the working at central office as a part-time position to be able to fulfill um, contracts and invoicing and uh, communication and website and marketing materials and things of that nature. So. She's been fantastic and she's been super busy this year and I would have to say it hasn't run any better than it has this year. It really has been. We were starting to learn and starting to, to understand um, different countries and how they operate and, and uh, although we can't provide um, immigration support or advice, we, can, we do know who they can talk to to give them support as they're getting study permits and stuff like that. So. So it's been it's a been a good year. It's been it's been pretty positive so far. So I think it's my last slide. So what's planned for this year in 2020? Um, again, with our partnership with Alberta Education, uh, we want to focus on a few areas, and we kind of follow their lead. Um, again, we're, we're, we're kind of more powerful as a group, especially in Southern Alberta. So Korea is one area that we're looking at. We're waiting on. Um, confirmation that potentially might be sending a group from Alberta to Korea to to work with some agents and go to a go go recruiting there for students. Um, the next one is Spain. I think if I do have to touch base with Spain once in a while, they're sending a lot of kids and their agents there to make sure that meet some of their families and parents. And that's another thing too. Part of this is some of this travel is involved to assure if you're sending uh, your child across the country. You, you'd be assured that when we come there to say hi and see a face and know where they're sending their child. So um, so we'll probably look at Spain potentially or France. So we'll probably only be one of the three that we'll do this year and then into next year, but these are possible areas that we'll recruit and look at and look at students that potentially want to come to Livingston Range School Division. So, and I think I got a couple of pictures. Um, if any of you ever want to come help us supervise some of these trips or come on some activities, we'd love to have you. We're always looking for folks. Look, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. You get to go. I've seen that scene a couple of times. It's great. Um, and so I, I encourage you, hopefully, if you get a chance, I'll let you know when those are. Like I said, the Hurricane Games coming up. We'd love to have some, any of you, all of you, to come and, and see the kids and do that. Uh, that's a ski caddy. I bring that up again. Um, 
it, a good looking bunch, isn't it? Isn't that a good looking mm -hmm. bunch? I love that picture. It's snowing already. That's this year. And I don't know if you know it, if it's starting to grow. Uh, that picture's getting bigger and we need a bigger lens because it's starting to, to grow. We're up to almost 80 students now. And a part of that is international education as well. And international education, we had uh, nine students up there, uh, up to nine students attend the Livingston Ski Academy. Um, but it's also, um, we have to we have to find homestays is where we're working at right now. So that's another thing we're working, but we, we hope that's a, a nice avenue to grow. And it also, it, it, it gives good um, understanding of what a Livingston Range is like um, when they come to certain these our academies and these programs. So next one. And there's the, uh, again, good group run, uh, good looking bunch of kids. Uh, there they are, we're, we're trying to bring them together as much as possible. And I, I put this one on there because there's a lot of smiling faces for the most part. So even if it's just pizza and it wasn't the pepperoni they wanted, uh, it was, uh, it, they are having good times. We've been receiving very positive feedback with the surveys um, that Jazz has set up to be able to understand um, what they're feeling, what their experiences have been. And it's been very successful thus far and from the students' perspectives as well and the parents' perspectives as well of the, from coming from these places. So I think that's it. Can I get one more? Yes, yeah, so just another another picture of some of the events that we like to take the kids on to. And lots of smiling faces. So I think that's it. So I open this up to any questions. Um, we, like I said, we're at 50 students now, and the majority of them are full-time students. And, and now we're having returning students more often than not um, that they come back for a second year. Um, so that, that speaks to the quality of the program. Um, and talking to Jazz, we're going to have a, vis a visioning session here right away and determine how how big we want to grow. We have more homestay parents, except for the Lumbrick, which I brought up. So if anybody knows anybody that's interested in, uh, in, in hosting in Lumbrick, um, we have an abundance of homestay parents. And that, again, speaks to the quality of programming. And we can place um, students in, in almost all our locations because of, of uh, the wonderful homestay families that we do have on board. So any questions? Anybody have any questions, comments? Trustee Long. It's incredible. Thank you, sir. Can I mark you down for the Hurricanes game then? Uh, no, just kidding. I'm going to do that too. Mark you down for the Hurricanes game too. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's in February. I'll get it to you all if you want to come see that and eat some popcorn and see some good hockey. So. Yeah. Trustee Poitras. Um, do we have any students that go overseas or go like stay with a host family somewhere else? for a full year from our division, or would that be something they did independent of us? It's independent of the division office. Okay. Often the schools do that, okay. and you see some of those. We have had students go on exchanges before. We had with Chile, and we've had with France. We've had exchanges in the past, yes, and it's usually uh, coordinated with the schools from that division and us, and so, so the schools kind of take care of that. Having said that, though, that's a very interesting idea. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying that we have not thought about opportunities for our kids for exchanges. Seeing no other questions. Thank you, Chad. That's great. Thank I you. love seeing all the smiling faces. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. All righty. On to our next presentation. Sorry, I got to turn the page here. Uh, inclusive Education, Nutrition, and Health. Uh, Mr. Richard Feller will update the board. Hopefully. I too would like to thank uh, Mr. Kuzik for not stepping into some of my time this time. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. I feel a great deal of gratitude um, to be a part of an amazing team that does such amazing work around supporting students through inclusive practices. From the team that we have at Central Office to the administrators, our learning support teachers and our teachers who are in the classroom. A few of the things that uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about are focused on learning support, comprehensive school health, and um, our divisional nutrition program. One of the things that um, I left you with last time was around the question of what is inclusion, what does it look like in LRSD? And I talked to you quite at length about some of the things that we had been doing all the way from a needs assessment to what we were going to be focusing on this year, which is direct PD around 
um, applicable practice for inclusion in classrooms. So the theoretical approach had been taken, people understand what it is, and now we're moving on to what do we do with that to support our students in our classroom. So going through the improvement process, then into what inv individualized program plans are and how that relates to all students. Um, I have some information for you around school profiles and what that looks like in terms of the numbers of students in all of our schools and how that's directly related to our um, coded students with uh, specific codes. And then we'll be talking quickly about nutrition and comprehensive school health. Principles of inclusion. I really, um, the other day I saw this sitting on, on Kevin Burke's desk and I was like, that is perfect. In your school, do you have inclusion students, inclusion facilitators, inclusion classrooms, inclusion programs? And the answer is no. The question is why not? And it's because everybody's included. So when we are a system where we don't have to think about special ed, from that perspective, that it's really about providing the needs for all students, then we know we are uh, where we need to be. So inclusion is not just, not just a word, it's more of a way of thinking and acting that really demonstrates um, our acceptance of all students. It's not just about the learners with the special needs, it's about embracing diversity and learning differences and providing those opportunities where we can. The following six key principles of inclusive schools are used to inspire excellence in student learning. And these are what we use in our learning services team to develop um, vision, to support program and practice and process. One of the key pieces to this that um, has come up over the last little while is really what are the three pillars that every school has that's successful? And they're really leadership, culture, and achievement. If those are your pillars in your school, you know that you're going to be focused on the right things. So when we look at those principles, those six principles of inclusion, and we take a look at how they relate to both, to all um, of these areas, we can see that anticipating and valuing and supporting diversity and learning learning differences really fits well under culture. That's where it's welcoming, caring, respectful, having a safe learning environment, creating a sense of belonging for all learners and their families. We can see that high expectations fits really well, probably in all three, but specifically for this uh, discussions really around achievement. Creating a culture of high expectations begins with an accessible curriculum and meaningful and relevant learning experiences. Educators and families act on the idea that with the right instructional supports, every learner can be successful. We look at number three, understanding learners' strengths and needs. Also fits very well under culture. And that's about gathering a process for gathering meaningful data and sharing at all levels of the system looking at reducing barriers within learning environments. Again, that um, fits very well under achievement. And that's all education partners work together to identify and reduce the barriers within the curriculum, the learning environment and or the instruction that are interfering with students' ability to be successful learners and to participate in the school community. Capacity building fits directly under leadership. We know that as we support our teachers, we support our learning support teachers and our administrators to know what inclusion looks like, sounds like, and feels like, that they're able to be the champions in the classroom, and that's where we have that change. Finally, when we look at principle number six under shared responsibility, it's really about leadership as well. All educational partners, including school and jurisdictional staff, families, community service providers, post-secondary institutions, teacher prep programs, and government are committed to collaboration and are committed to the success of all learners. So how does that relate to some of the hands-on? What are we gonna do with this information? We have worked really hard as a learning services team to create, to create a um, session for our for our learning support teachers and our administrators. Taking our IPPs from something that are good to great, 
we need it to be something that isn't just a paper document that is signed at the end of every term um, that demonstrates that we're doing something for students, but it's really something about our collaboration. It's about how we meet the needs of students. And so the format that we're going to create, the process that we're going to create, is something that is a little bit unique. And um, I believe it will start to really develop our shared understanding of the language that we use, of the supports and processes that we have in place. One of the pieces is really about unlocking the potential of students who struggle with learning. We know that if we can provide programs that meet struggling learners' needs, we're meeting all students' needs. We know that we need to be focused on principles. We know that as a jurisdiction, we're really trying to develop our language around what true principles are. We have the same understanding of what principles are at this time um, throughout our jurisdiction. They're universal, they're timeless, they're at work whether we understand them or not. There's some key components that we really need to focus on as we go through in the development of, of individual program plans. That's really collaboration is the first. I'm going to go through these very quickly. Um, so if there's anything that, that doesn't make sense to you as we're going through this, please just interject. Obviously, the best way to support any student is through collaboration. There isn't one person who has all the right answers. We need to come up with third alternatives, which are things that are better than what each of us as individuals would bring to the table. So we all know more collectively than we do individually. We need to have meaningful parental involvement. Yes, we make sure that we have parents come in. Yes, we make sure that they're part of the process, but we believe that there's a better way. We need to have a good identification and assessment procedures to identify where students are, what they need, and how do we know when, we've met, when they've met the outcomes um, that we have set for them or that, more importantly, that they've set for themselves. We need to have ongoing assessment. This isn't just three times a year when we sign off on our, on our IPPs. We need to make sure that we have uh, processes in place where students know what they need to, that, where students need to know where they're at and how they're going to get there. Families have their role and schools have their role as well. Education can and probably should look different for every student. And so this is one of those pieces, the frameworks that we can use to start the discussion about what that is about. As we know our students, we see them through relationship, we're able to understand what their needs are better. We need to ensure that everybody is aware of transition planning. We need to know that transitioning isn't just from one grade to the next, it's about from one class to the next, it's about from one course to the next, sometimes it's about one friendship to the next, and it really is about something much bigger than just these milestones that we're perpetuating. This really links very well to uh, Indigenous perspective where we don't follow a logical sequential um, path for understanding. We gather information and learning from the chaos of things that are around us based on our experience as we flow through our life's journey. Right now, this is one of the key pieces that we're really focused on. We know that students who have learning disabilities through the research, we know that students who have learning disabilities really need to have the ability for self-advocacy. That when they leave us, they need to be able to have that, that ability or they're not going to be successful. Um, in the teacher quality standards, number four on inclusion, number or letter H, talks about needing to provide leadership. This is one of those pieces where we can provide leadership in an authentic way, where students can take responsibility for what they need and ask for the things that they need in collaboration with their teachers. So this is being done with them and not to them. We know that accommodations are what we need in order to have all students being successful. And I'm going to share some data with you a little bit later that demonstrates how the accommodations are already making a difference in our schools. Instruction is key, and especially for those with um, 
learning disabilities or those who learn differently. Sometimes it's going to need to look differently. This is one of the pieces that we're really taking a look at in how we can become more systematic at how we approach some of the things that we're doing. An IPP goal is not a lot different than goals that we set for ourselves um, in all aspects of our lives. And so we believe that you know, if we focus on the wildly important goals, that we act on our lead measures, create a compelling scoreboard, and create a cadence of accountability, that IPPs will become more authentic, and they'll be a document that isn't just put on the side. It'll be something where our students are able to create their scoreboards that relate to their goals, where they can take responsibility for the steps that they're going to put into place. This kind of language allows us to create that system where everybody understands what we're talking about when we're talking about it. I'm not going to go too much further into this just because it goes into the step-by-step -step sort of process, but I wanted to bring us back into um, presentation and the school profiles. So. What we're going to be doing this year is really taking a look at creating those IPP processes through conversation, through professional development with our LSTs and our administrators who are then going to be able to take that back to their staffs and help them support their students in their classroom through that understanding. I'm gonna, you're all going to get this information, so I'm going to skip down to the pieces that I believe um, really speak to Richard, the information. Richard, yes. is IPP... Is that an individual program plan? Plan. Okay, yes. I just wanted to make sure that yeah. I had it right. Yeah. I was like, not all students have IPP goals. This is for students with. And this is the interesting thing. Yes, they are the ones that have uh, IPPs, but we also have an ability to have an ISP, which is an individual student profile. But we also can just use this process of of support for any student that is struggling at any time. It's more of a way of thinking about it rather than a way of doing it. And so we're trying to just create that, that uh, opportunity. And so what would, when would a child get an IPP plan? Not necessarily when they're young, but any child in need could get it at any time throughout their school Yeah, career. we're responsible to have program plans in place for any student who is uh, coded severe, mild, moderate. Okay. And so those ones are specific, but setting up a goal or a plan with a student okay. for achievement doesn't look a whole lot different. Perfect, thank you. Um, I did want to, I recognized this the other day as I was doing some of the data, uh, around FNMI, uh, percentage of FNMI in our, in our school jurisdiction. It's interesting to see that if you take a look at WA Day and FP Walsh, they've actually, um, decreased in numbers. However, every one of our schools has increased in numbers. We have every one of our schools now represented with a, with an, a First Nation Métis or Inuit student in the school, which is something we've never had before. So, yeah, due to Sandra's work of, of helping people to understand what that is and what it means. So we've actually had an increase in our First Nation population throughout the jurisdiction, and it's not in the places that we expected. Um, these are the number of st students with a code in each of our schools, and you can see we're everywhere from 5% uh, of the population being coded all the way up to 18% of the population being coded. That translates into uh, plus minus for this year comparatively to last year. So you can see that we have um, students um, in each of our schools either increasing, decreasing, or staying the same. And at the end of all of this, we have 11 less students with uh, a code. I suggest that that's because we are providing the necessary accommodations in the classroom that are supporting our students and they're being more successful. Yes? Um. 
I think that really shows too when we had Kevin and Shannon here when they presented and they talked about how um, they're not called out as much anymore because they've put things in place that um, the teachers can work with the students now and that they just are are more adapt to working better in the classroom. So just even listening to their presentation and what you're pointing out here, you can see that everything's just working together really well. Thank you. And, and hopefully you can see that it's intentional. As you go back to the principles that I talked about of inclusions, inclusive schools, that um, those are one of the, that's one of those pieces, is that it is collaborative for sure. Building that capacity. Okay, so um, that brings me to the end of that piece for um, inclusive education. Are there any questions? Um, as the numbers seem to be going up and um, we have more students that need IPPs, like these individual plans and stuff, is there specific training or PD that's happening for our teachers to help them to be able to be in an environment with, you know, maybe 17 to 20 students where perhaps 18% of them do have these needs? Is there special training that we have for them? Is that something we focus on? On PDs or? We focus through our learning support team and our admin council on providing those opportunities and then they take that to the staff. There are many opportunities through SAPDC, through other consortia, um, online. It, it's, there's lots of opportunities for that. Yeah. yeah, as well as one of the things that we're going to be working on this year um, is creating modules for our educational assistance. So when you come into Livingston Range School Division, we will have um, those learning opportunities for all of our staff, uh, or sorry, for all of our educational assistants. Any other questions? Okay. So I just, uh, Mr. Seguin had asked me to just quickly go through the draft admin procedure on seclusion rooms. Uh, I can I can tell you that we do not have any seclusion rooms in Livingston Range School Division. If we were to have a seclusion room, we would have to follow the policy and the guidelines that are in place that were put forward by the Alberta government. We still need to ensure that we have um, a, a procedure in place that that delineates exactly what we need to do around seclusion and physical restraint. And so. Um, we have that in place and we'll be going through that tomorrow at our um, admin procedure review committee. So this will be part of your package and I'm not gonna go through it all because it is fairly, fairly lengthy. Um, but it does go through the definitions, goes through the procedure of what, it, it, what you do in each of those circumstances. Did you get a copy of this? Yes, you okay. will get a copy of this for sure. Yeah. It will be. This is all, all of the presentation that I'm giving right now will okay. be given to you at the end. I just really wanted you to be focused on me <laughs> as your uh, peasant talking. Yeah. And then it um, goes into forms that will need to be used in terms of reporting, things like that. Okay. I just have another question on that. Sure. So seclusion rooms have always been a hot topic. Um, they were, we had them, we didn't have them. And so now you're allowed to have them again, but what exactly are they using them for? Like what exactly would that kind of room be to a school? Because like we don't have any, so um, why would schools, I guess I, un I explained, I guess a little bit about it and why. A, a contextual in Alberta, oftentimes it's associated with a congregated setting where you have multiple students with the same similarities in terms of behavior that might need to be managed um, in a different way where potentially the violence um, and risk to self and others is so high that there needs to be a space for them to be able to uh, not be injured or to injure others. We have not had that um, need at this point. And so if the need ever arose, um, not all schools might have room for that or, you know, potentially to, to have that. So I guess that's something down the road we'd have to address, but so. We would look at every other possible option 
in order to support a child who is um, that dysregulated before we would consider having okay. a seclusion room. Trustee Poitras? I think it speaks a lot to our team to say that we, you know, have not had that and to, you know, we've had our team go out and do training and all of these things and we get a lot of positive feedback on um, students that do have uh, learning disabilities or, or different things going on in their life that they need this extra support and I, I really think it speaks to the power of our team and to Richard's team that this isn't something that we have needed in our division and that we've been able to keep it from getting there or they have so I really commend you guys on that. Thank you and I, I'm sure that Kevin and Shannon had spoken to you about our proactive approach through SEBA training. Awesome. Uh, on to school nutrition. We were so happy when uh, we heard that we were going to be getting the nutritional dollars back. We know that this is part of what we need in order to satisfy some of those preconditions for learning. We have many students who are coming to us who are hungry. We have many students whose needs are not being met. And this is a, just a portion of what we can do to help them be successful in school. Um, I want to focus on the fact that um, all of our elementary schools have their nutrition program up and running. Um, they are receiving lots of good feedback from families. Um, and they received some other feedback prior to uh, the nutrition grant coming in that wasn't as favorable. So again, we're thankful for that opportunity to be able to support their children in our schools. We also have an aquaponic system now in every single one of our elementary schools. And um, one of our student leaders, Nick, Housing Gay has been going around to some of the high schools now and talking to them about what aquaponic systems are and how they can be utilized in the school. So because of the nutrition grant, it became the impetus for some of this growth and development. Um, Mr. Kuzik has worked alongside with um, Palliser School Division and Lethbridge College to create a um, dual credit opportunity for our students. And because we have these aquaponic systems in our schools, it becomes something that our kids can connect to authentically rather than just through online learning. On to comprehensive school health and health champions. This is our, my last slide. Um, last time we talked about what wellness champions do and who they are. And I just wanted to share with you some of the things that they're currently doing. Um, I thought it was quite impressive as we take a look through the lens of the pillars of comprehensive school health. We look at what's happening in the priority areas of the social environment. We have everything from schools that are creating that mentorship time during flex blocks, having student leadership groups, um, going into staff activities, staff appreciation. So that there's a mix of things that are happening for staff and for students, and it depends on where the school is at within their journey. So some are already having um, set opportunities for students, and now they're engaging their staff, and some have had set opportunities for staff and now are engaging their students. And it's really about doing it all. And so that role modeling that's happening is, is, uh, is paying off. We take a look at what's happening for the physical environment, we have everything from yoga, PD wellness activities, teacher modeling, place-based learning, including what staff do, as well as students, uh, creating uh, positive mental health opportunities. We have uh, schools who are doing entire K to six sensory paths for their students. Um, we have students who are taking a leadership role in their school to support other students. And then we take a look at what's happening in uh, active living. We have lots of activities, hiking, student yoga club. In fact, the student yoga club at West Meadow, there were so many students that they had to go out and buy um, more yoga mats. And that was supported through ever active schools. They're, they're having over 100 students and a, um, a lunchtime coming out to do yoga. So I'm not selecting any because of of uh, things that I think are better or worse. I'm just taking a random sample as we go through. And then finally, healthy eating. Um, making sure that at Willow Creek that 
the cafeteria is following the Alberta Nutrition Guidelines, um, that's huge. It's hard to do, and they're doing a very, very good job of it. Um, relay races to promote healthy snack choices and decrease junk food uh, consumption uh, at colonies, that was interesting to me. I didn't realize that um, that was a concern, but uh, Alyssa, who represents the colonies, said that it's something that the kids are now paying attention to and choosing to um, take some of those healthy snacks rather than some of the less healthy snacks. All right, so that is my presentation. If there are any other questions, please let me know. That's exciting. I, I mean, I'm, that's the first time I've ever seen our colony schools involved in something like this, so I think that's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. I really like that. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Richard, that was great. A lot of information and you can see the great things that we're doing in Livingston Range. Thank you. Alrighty. Okay, 3.10, we're ahead of schedule by 20 minutes, so that's pretty good. Uh, we're moving on to our key messages now. So, what would anybody like to see our one to four key messages be? <laughs> Reappointment of superintendent. Yep. Our two presentations. Absolutely. Combined as one usually. Yeah. Should probably highlight the changes to our health and yeah. caring Bob policy. Policy twenty one. So that was appointment of superintendent, our two presentations, and board policy 21. Everybody's good at that? Great. Look at that. We got three. Yeah. Two presentations. <laughs> we always can. All right, everybody, I'd like to uh, recommendation for, <laughs> it says Burdette, the trustees go in camera. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get a motion to go on camera? Your name's already down, so Trustee Burdett. <laughs> that, was that it? Yep. Okay, thank you. At uh, 3.11 p.m. Uh, motion to adjourn at uh, 341 by Trustee Poitras.